Let's have a look at um, a type of question which might give you some difficulty, which isn't that hard, but you haven't really been exposed to it, so it's worth thinking about it. And so this is just a pure Newton's second law question, but it does confuse people a little bit at times. So what I'm drawing is two boxes, essentially. And those boxes have different masses, and you can kind of guess that they have different masses by the fact that I've drawn them different sizes. And so what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to make that box, say, a 9 kilogram box. So that's a mass of 9 kilograms. That one's a 2 kilogram box. And there is a force applied to them. Okay. Now let's just imagine that the force being applied to them. Someone want to tell me what the force might be? Five newtons. So five newton force is being applied to them. So the question might then start with, what is acceler? You can't get the speed first up. You can't we have the velocity first up because there's a missing thing, not momentum. But you might be asked for the first part of the question to find out a. The acceleration. If you just rearrange that yep. Now the thing about the acceleration for this is that, guys, one thing you have to be aware of is this idea of a system. So, where is the force in this case? The five newton force. Oops. Five newton force is actually being applied to that box there. So they're being accelerated in this direction. Oh, is it going to be eleven over five? So, well, you know that force equals mass times acceleration, that's easy enough. You know that you've got a 5 newton force acting. You know that the mass is... Yeah, well the mass... Do you find out total mass first up? Which is Marnie? Is it 9 times 2? No, because it's two boxes pushed against each other. It's 11. 11 kilograms times acceleration. So the acceleration is going to be, as someone suggested, 5 Newtons divided by the 11 kilograms, and if you do that, the, uh, 2 .2. Well, that's not. Five divided by 11. That's the simplest form. It is. It's going to. If you look at it this way, it's going to be something in the range of point. 48 or 0.47. 8.46, I think. <laughs> Imagining it's around that, okay. Now, the question is then. Oh. <laughs> you were close. Ridiculous. Round it up. Can you round no. it up? <laughs> okay. Your next question might be, okay, how much force is being applied to the second box, box B? Now, the thing is, well, the thing is here, that that box has got the same acceleration as that box, hasn't it? Because they're in contact. So the force is still the same formula, MA. The mass in this case of that box is 2 kilograms. But the acceleration of that particular box is 0 0.45 metres per second squared. So now you're going to find out that the total force applied to that 0.9 newtons. Okay, see how that works? Well, that's that box has to be accelerating at the same with the accel same acceleration as that box. So, what force? The question you're actually asking is what force is needed to accelerate that box to with, with that acceleration? That, that second box is going to have more force applied to it than the whole. No, right? Not nine. Oh, point nine. Point nine. Yes. So you can switch the formula around. So what I'm, can you do it to find the mass? 
Yes. So, so in the, in this this way, you were told, for example, well, let's put another another one up and work on it. So imagine that you have three boxes. Box A, box B, box C. And you know that box A is twice as, he um, is twice as heavy as B, so the mass of B. Well, A is twice as heavy as B, so B is what? And let's make that, well, let's make it four, just so there's a nice ratio working there. It's not a nice ratio, it's stuffed it up. No, it's like one, two, four. So, B <laughs> equals A on two, and C equals A on eight, isn't it? Is that right? Oh, I said I've done, yeah. That's what I meant it to be anyway. So I've got some random masses there, okay? And what I can say is I can say they are all accelerating. All right. If you want to make it two meters per second. Because there is a force being applied. Whoops, missed the right one. No, that's you, Riley. So Riley's applying a force to it. And the force he's applying to it is, say, 20 newtons. So, then you can ask yourself the question very simply, as you were, what mass is involved? So, you've got the force equals ma. So, yeah, it's just 20 newtons is the force equals the total mass times acceleration, which is 2. So, obviously, the masses are going to equal all up 10 kg. And then you can divide all that through to find out what the answer is. Yeah. And then you just have to do the ratios to work it out, which I can't be bothered doing. I thought it was going to be fun. Well, they're accelerating at 2 metres per second. There's a force of 20 newtons being applied. And because of that, F equals MA, well, it's 20 newtons is mass times 2 metres per second squared. So you divide both sides by 2. And that gives you 10 kilograms as the total mass. And then if I was going to get really fussed about it, then I'd say that there's one lot of A. Well, you have to wear it in terms of C, actually, don't you? So there's one lot of C there. How many lots of C there? Two, so there's one. There's two there, and there's four there. So that's going to be a total of seven lots of mass. So then you can divide, you know, each mass part is going to be 10 on 7. So what were those answers? So what did you get? So C is 1.42. That one is? hope so. Looks roughly right. Mm. And that gives you the masses for all those. Now, then you could ask yourself from this question, if you wanted to, you go back and do the other thing again, what is the force acting from B on C? What is the force acting from B? Yeah. On B. And then... Oh, it's the same force that B is acting on C. So then you just work, use that acceleration times the mass of that particular box and we'll give you the thing that you do with it. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, I talked about that early. I can't, um, because of dealing with the theory of students and doing other things. Uh, now it's all going to go on that. Mm. Um. You realise, of course, that you're probably being recorded what you're saying there. It's probably not. 
<laughs> really appropriate. I hope so. I'll minimise. Okay. Now, what was that question about refractive indices? Um, yeah, I was just, I was doing the practice exam last night. I was going through the textbook and trying to do it again. Do you want me to bring up the practice exam and have a look at it? No, I, I'd just like it if we could just, hold on, I'd like it if we could just do a couple of questions. Yeah, that's easy. So, like, um, no, angle of refraction as well. So, if you've got an angle of incidence of 60 degrees and the uh, refractive index of the object you're refracting into is blah, 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 1.6, what is the refractive index? I put the practice exam up on the Google, Google didn't I? Not oh, from there. Can you send us that like, outline share of what's in your test? Can you also send us a couple of practice tests? That's what you have. Um. It's always nice to know that you've been studying. I wonder if how that if that records the um, ASCII for the. Uh... You need to bring a um, medical certificate. Mm -hmm. Well, you can just get a. Um, the pharmacy can issue one too. I think it is. Which one do you want? Two at two thousand eleven, two thousand thirteen. Two thousand thirteen. Hilarious. It's funny enough. We just talked about bandwidth and availability a minute ago, so. So how do you think you went with these? You, you done both these? Um, no. How does all that dirt get them with the window seal? Okay. No, the scuff. I'm being for real. How does all that dirt get them? Oh, yeah. I've no idea, actually. Someone's been outside and doing something wrong. Yeah. Oh, that's the exact same exam I've got. Oh, shut up. <laughs> There's a reason for that. That's the one I posted up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where's the refractive index question? One question. Actually, that, that's the question I was asking about, the refractive one. That one? Oh, could you do that um, number eight, sir? No, 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 no. <laughs> Which one am I doing? Uh, the one with the, the gradient. Uh, yeah, keep going down. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that one. Yeah! <laughs> okay, yep. Yeah, I, was just, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? All right. So. Are you over the top? Let me see if I can do it. The ball is dropped from rest and falls with acceleration. Okay, so it's actually not too hard to do. Well, you've got time to fall squared, right? And then down the side here, you've got the distance. Well, that's times squared. It says so. It's in the units of s squared, doesn't it? Yeah. So you should read 25 off, and you read that off, and it has actually got a line there. What you'll find is that five seconds, it falls a distance of 90 meters. So therefore, your formula says that um, g is going to equal two times, two times, no, just let me get through it. This is half, you multiply across, two times D, divided by T squared, isn't it? 
So at 25, G is going to equal 2 times 90 all over 25. So it's going to be it's going to be seven. That should be over twenty-five. Sorry. Hmm. You always, you choose the best result in these. Okay, you always choose the best result. So it's seven. It's C. Okay. So it's just a because it's the formula. Because that's how it works. Pythagoras formed the length of square. Because Pythagoras was Greek and lived four thousand. But if Pythagoras had any sense, he would have realised he discovered the cosine rule, except at ninety degrees. Yeah, and we, if you make cos ninety, it's one. Yeah. And so it just falls out to be um, what Pythagoras had. But if you know anything about trigonometry, you worked out he'd worked out a special case. Okay. How did I work out what cause is? Doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> this one this one here would is something like what we're working on now. You actually had a graph of uh, velocities and they're asking to do some work around collisions and it's, it involves momentum. Show that the momentum is conserved in the collision. Okay? So to show that it's conserved, what do you have to show? Uh, there's another loss. Yeah, so what you're trying to show, the word conserved, and we'll get the boys at the back here, the word conserved simply means that what you have at the beginning is what you have at the end or vice versa, what you have at the end is what you have at the beginning. So you've got to show, they're simply asking you to show that your initial is equal to your final. The final one is actually greater. No, and that, watch why. So what you need to show is that m car 1 times u car 1 plus m car 2 u car 2 equals m car 1 v car 1 plus m car 2 v car 2, right? That's what you're trying to work out. Now that just means that the, the initial... Now you could actually rearrange that if you wanted, but let's just do it very simply. So in the first case, here's car 1. Alright? What is its initial velocity? 6 metres per second east. And what is its mass? So... Its initial five hundred times six, which is three thousand kilograms meters per second. Right, you're really not helping us by talking over us. Car B or car two, it has a velocity of zero. So one car's travelling east, one car's sitting still, it smacks into it. After the collision, this car is doing what? Yes. It's travelling in the opposite direction. It's still 500 kilograms, we hope, awesome. times, and it's now travelling at how minus two. It it's bounced. Four. So it's now minus 1,000. And this car has now got a velocity, it's now heading east. So it got this car, the first car has hit that one and bounced that way and the other one's been pushed along. So this car has a mass of 800 kilograms and it has a forward speed of 5 minutes per second. So it has 4,000. But don't forget... The total of zero plus the three thousand on that side is going to be three thousand. That plus that on this side, you've got 
4,000 plus minus 1,000. And if you just put that calculation into those lines below, that would be right. So if momentum is conserved, how come? Uh, you know how you've got two big shapes there. You've got before it hits and after it hits. Before it hits, there's six spaces. After it hits, there's seven. It goes from minus two to five. If there's more, I don't know why. No, there's not. The math shows there's more. It's just due with the scaling of the thing. But like, well, look. No, have a look. That one's dropped. Yes, because that's the velocity on that scale. You, you have to add into the fact that... Let's pick it up using green. You have to add into the fact that's a 500 kilogram car and that's an 800 kilogram car. So if they're 500, you'd have to have the, the change in the graphs be mirrored. But because... That one is what? Five, yeah, a bit heavier. I'm not going to work it out. Hmm. Yeah, so, either, uh, so how is it? It crashes and then it just starts going at a constant velocity of five. Because, well, that's easy enough too. We can explain that in terms of Newton. You guys know this in the real, real life. If a car hits another car and pushes it along, how long is the force between the two cars acting? Only what, for a split second while they're in contact. Once the other one bounces off, it's no longer being accelerated, so it just rolls off at a pretty constant speed until it happens to hit an unlucky pedestrian or a tree or something. Pedestrian, that's what it's called. Not that. Well, no, why? Yeah, there's friction. That's the problem. Oh, so, so, so how come in that graph for three seconds it's rolling at a constant Three seconds isn't very long for a car to roll down a road. You go to motor racing, you'll see cars rolling off in all sorts of ways with up to that time. So that's not terribly ex um, ex unusual. Okay. This one, determine the average force car B applied to car A. Uh -huh. So you need to sort of calculate the, the difference. Of the no, because this, these questions are often just designed, they're not hard questions, they're designed to make you think through. Okay, so what is force? Tell me, mass times acceleration. What is acceleration? No, no, ignoring that, what's acceleration? No, change in velocity. So it's my final velocity minus my initial velocity over the time it took to happen, right? Now, if you look at your graph, can I map the change in velocity of car B? Yes. Yeah. So it's changed from, it's gone up to 5, it was at 0, so the change in velocity happens to be 5, whoops, let's draw 5, 5 metres per second, right? And how long did it take for that to happen? Three, three there to there, three seconds. So there's my average acceleration. What's five divided by three? Okay, so now what I know is I know A. Then I know what to know the average force applied. Well, I know the mass of the car. The mass of the car, I think, was 800 from memory. Uh, you're asked to show the average force car B applies to car A. But Newton's third law tells you... That every action has an equal opposite. So I could have done... I actually could have worked out that this, that change. I could have worked out that from that. But then I can I like to use that time frame. The other one's just as easy. One, two, three and a half. Oh, all right. So, so, so that's a bit wrong. But once I've worked it out, then all I need to do is say F equals 800, which is the mass of the car, times acceleration, which we found out was 5 on 3.5. Come on, Arnie, quick, you beat him. What's wrong with my head? 1,142.9. Wait, so, so you found the average velocity of the car, right? Then you no, and I found the change in velocity, which is the average acceleration. Remember, F equals MA. 
So I said, I know my force is my mass times my acceleration. What is acceleration? It's my average change in velocity. I found my velocity change by mapping it on the graph. It gives me the amount of time, it gives me the change in velocity, and then I can work it out. Yeah. So if you for some reason just um, went for the difference and stuff, brought out A, so like 6 minutes or so, I'm going to minus 2, yeah. and all that kind of stuff, would it come up with the same answer? And you, so Better do. It wouldn't be right. It, uh, it, would, be it would be right. Wrong. No, it wouldn't be wrong. Um, and unless they violate Newton's laws and something's happened to your forces somewhere along the line, it should equal up. So what's going on with doing it in a meter against positive? I have no idea. Yeah, go on. Um, there's this question about refractive index down in the test. Can we please Try and find it. All right. Um, oil drops. Oh, that's just... Um, yeah, yeah. It's that's easy. Yeah. It's a ticker tape in disguise. That one I should do with you guys. Okay, I'll come back to that. Reference energy, draw a label diagram, ripples. Boy. You learned lots, you just didn't remember it. This is going to be an exciting video when it comes on. Oh, look. There's the question. That one. Oh, this one. Define the term refraction. You can do that. No, it's the next one. No, well, let's do that one anyway. Yeah. Refraction is uh, the change in velocity as no. light enters another medium. That's literally what the antecedent of the next No, no, I'm giving guide, not the whole test. There you go. That's one mark worth. Direction of light due to change velocity. Yep. Light or MR. Can I make that shrink? Who said it was control minus? It's control plus. Okay. First part of the question draw a ray of light instant at 6 degrees in the middle of side AC. So, look, guys, this is really, really important. No, 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 really, really important. It says to the middle of AC. Yeah. So they expect you actually to come and get a ruler and find the middle point. Just <laughs> <laughs> to me, because I got squ about there, you reckon? Somewhere around there. <laughs> Which way? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then you're going to draw a normal in of some sort, which is really, really good there, I know. And then you're going to cover and you're going to get your protractor. Oh, we we just get You're going to draw that line in and you're going to draw an arrow on it to indicate which way it's going. And you're going to put 60 degrees there because if you don't, you're not going to get full marks. All right? Make sure you do that. Calculate the angle of. Now, 1.6 and 60 degrees. Calculate the refractive index for this rate and nearest. Okay, so. Oh, sorry, the angular refraction. What you know is the refractive indice. No, I don't know that. Equals sine i on sine r. So then I know for this is that that's 1.6. It's just a number. Equals the sine of 60 divided by sine r. Now that's going to get a little bit messy. I'm going to put the bats up here for you guys, okay? So you can see what I'm doing. So with this, the first thing you're going to have is 1.6 sine r is going to equal sine 60. That's going to give you a number, right? That side's just a number. 
So sine R zero point one. Times 1.6, correct? Because I've just, sorry, not times, I'm silly. Let's make it divide by 1.6, correct? And then what you need to do is you need to find, to get R, R is going to equal sine minus 1, and what was the answer you had there, Marnie, of 0. point. There's the answer. Okay. That's how you do it. Tom, uh, sorry, Jack, does that answer your question? So what you've done is you've just solved an equation for the two values that you have. Just take the original, plug in the angle I know, and you rearrange it. Is that a, is that a, a refractive? Like, what's that symbol up there? That's the refractive index. It's just curly N. Refractive index, I mean, you can just write as an N. But that's um, or that's actually um, no, I've forgotten one. Complete, complete run. Okay, and then we just. Draw I think it's uh, hey, but yeah, and then you just draw it on. Eta, eta, yeah, eta. That's the one. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, we want to go back to the electricity one. Household electricity, blah blah blah. Oh, here we go. So you've got a, got a couple of resistors in a circuit, um, which, if you wanted to, I mean, you could actually just finish that off and say there's some sort of power supply there. I don't care what it is really. Define electrical resistance. It's the ratio of voltage. Well, actually. According to the syllabus, if I wrote this, if I did that, that would be correct. If you said that in anywhere else but the HSC, they'd look at you with derision, laugh at you and send you back to school. Because that is only a, a ratio, it's actually not a definition of resistance, not by the wildest. Anyway, that's what the syllabus says it is. In the words, it is the ratio of voltage. That's the answer there. Got that? That's one mark. If I so if I wrote that in the test, you give me a mark. Yeah, unfortunately, because it's wrong. But I had to give it to you because the syllabus says it's right. That's one reason I hate the syllabus. So if you wanted, if you want, don't ask me. Don't do. what energy is, we can just write P equals. No, you can't. F over Q. No, you can't. Because. Yes or no? I've already said this widely around the place that the syllabus has mistakes and shouldn't have them. <laughs> Why has this gone like this? So do you reckon that this drink bottle is going to be allowed for the example? It's, it's completely see-through even though it's tinted. Oh, it's Don't know. Anyway, let's move on to the part that Marnie needs us to talk about, which is this thing. Why has it gone all cloudy? This, this I don't understand this. Okay. Um, no, if you put equals F on Q, the reason you won't get that right is because that's a definition of electrical energy near an isolated charge. Yeah, but if they, but ask, if they ask what is energy, yeah, yeah, I mean, if, if they, they ask, ask what electrical energy is, and you gave that. Uh, it's one way of finding it, yeah. Okay. Describe how conductors are connected in this circuit. Partial series, partial parallel. Are you marking parallel? So, yes, I do mark it. How would you tell? How do you tell if something is a series or something's in parallel? Because there's only one current path in this uh, That's right. You work out. You've got things in parallel where you see a splitting in the current. Yeah, that, that's the power. And so, in here, there must be a splitting in the path. So, the, the, one, the question is, which ones are in series and which ones are in parallel? Those ones make one resistor, 
Because that makes the other one. So these two resistors act as one. It's effectively a 6 ohm resistor on that arm, yeah. Calculate total resistance between X and Y. Okay, so what they're asking to say is that you've got... Um, well, the first thing you've got... If, let's just... If that's A, B and C. The first thing you're going to do to find the resistance in this arm of it, resistance of total AB is going to be 6 ohms, right? And then the resistance for the other part of it is going to be 1 on R total, because they're in parallel to that one, is 1 on 6 plus 1 on 3, which is going to equal 1 on 6 plus 2 on 6, which is going to equal 3 on 6. Now, because that's the inverse of it, as you say, you have to flick it over, which means RT is going to equal to 6 on 3, which is 2 ohms. Well, that is 1 on R total. So you have to inverse it, which is 6 on 3, and it gives the total of 2 ohms. Does that make sense, Marnie? I hope it makes a lot of sense, because you might have to answer one. Um, the potential difference is 12 volts of applied across XY. What current will flow through the shaded conductor? Well, 12 volts. So you got 12 volts. 12 volts there, right? Flowing through the whole thing. That's the total voltage. Where is it coming from? Is it positive XY or like Well, they're imagining they've got something across there. They don't see if it's AC or not. Could be an AC. And then you know that your total resistance around the whole thing was t 2 ohms. And you know that for each of these devices, V equals IR, correct? What do you know happens for uh, parallel? So the voltage through this arm of it is still going through that will be 12 volts, right? Um, and the current through there, you need to work out. That's what the question was. So it's going to be 12V on 3O, 3 ohms will give I, which happens to be 4 amps. That one. That one. Um, that's going to be if I work out what the total um, amperage around the, the thing is using V equals IR right I get the total current around here is going to be 12 on 2 which is 6 ohms is that right? Yeah. oh I was saying 6 ohms yeah 12 on 2 6 And hmm. yeah, so that's going to be four amps through there. Two amps on that side, isn't it? That should be right. What else do we need to do, Marnie? Any other questions so in this like section? I've only got a few seconds, so... Oh, right on. Okay. I'll try and email that stuff out for you guys. And...